Peace, peace, pal. Welcome to another episode of Knowledge Radio. A place where knowledge is born. This is your host. And I'm here to pay tribute and honor a profound warrior scholar, African Senate educator, and true one in the liberation and recall for the minds and hearts of African people. Speak of our disciple, Dr. Bobby Eugene Wright, on this day. In, uh, excuse me, 1934, one of the oldest all-black towns in America, Hobson City, Alabama. Clinical psychologist, scholar, educator, political activist, and African. The aid of our warrior sister Sass in the building to share. No. We are going to read the psychopathic racial personality and other essays by Dr. Bobby Eugene Wright. Start with that. I'm going to read from them. <clears throat> Count of Revolutionary Daily Thoughts by Dr. Molly Cable Molly Baruti. You can get this book and his other books from www.occupinhouse.com. Let's get into it. March 1st. Blessed are those who struggle. Oppression is worse than the grave. To live a noble cause than to live and die a slave. Now, group, the last poets. Shout out to Baba Abiodun Oyewali, the founder of that revolutionary group, the last poets. Let's get into Baba's explanation. Nation buildings, individuals and their families. Develop challenge join with individuals and families. From these increasingly larger extended families came because we recognized the immensity of our struggle to regain ourselves people and the forces which put us against any visible undeveloped building effort. We know that we must start small and sure recognize that public advertising and our voices and flamboyancy have done little but serve individual egos up as easy targets for imperialistic predators. Therefore, we know that if we are to be Successful and the truth quietly do the work. Of the foundation of a nation that will close ranks gradually over the coming generations. There is no secret that this will be a different system of Africa teaches us that when the stick is bent too far in one direction, it will have to be bent farther in the other direction in order for it to again become street. Or to do this right, must be value the lessons that come through of many generations. It will take to turn our families back into a nation. 
The affirmation, I am an intrepid nation builder. Affirmation, I am an intrepid nation builder. Affirmation, I am an intrepid nation builder. In Yasasim, daily calendar, revolutionary daily thoughts, and other than an ancestor, Dr. Wally Kepomani for Rudy. So, as I said, you can get this in all of his other books via www.akabinhouse.com. That is A K O B E N. So, as I said, we're here. To pay homage ode to the Sasafo warrior and warrior African ancestor, Dr. Bobby Eugene Wright. Corner of Menticide and who worked as a dope in this psycho spirit evolutionary war for the hearts and minds of African people. So such a thing before I... Shalom. I'm just gonna um listen to what you're saying and and hopefully I can be, I'll be able to chime in. Yes. Okay. Let's read what to say about him. How does one measure greatness? There are a few in the right place or position asking the penetrating questions and demanding and correct the racial situation in the United States and as pitiful pawns in our international game of control and manipulation worldwide misuse is an accepted byproduct of business as usual. The loss by magnified in a hundredfold because he was a constant swimmer. The professional, the concerned and loving family man, the Garveyite race man, always a step or two ahead of theories, masquerading in knowledge. That the right was to get the right, excuse me, or to get to the right place not only to ask the right questions, but to demand and enforce this truth. We do not recognize greatness amongst us. Our measurements of importance are generally faulty in the superficialities of life. Where, one's, where one lives, the type of clothing one wears, the car one drives, the number of bodyguards that one can employ to carry bags and open and close doors. Through the dishonesty was the passion. As a clinical study understood the mind of an enslaved people, the mental state of a people caught in the world stolen for Europeans, his view was that the high, excuse me. <clears throat> His view was that the high African standards that gave the world civilization were now confusing. Well, now, now, Dr. Wright was a visionary with standards, values, integration, and essence value African traditions and culture. In the prime of his thinking, he was involved in his presence was a stabilizing force for people to become anchored to video machines and slightlessness. He understood the power of ideas and was constantly nonsense and mediocrity. His concern was for widening the distance and the haves 
and the have nots. The job giver seekers. Bobby's love was unconditional and select. He had been burned often by the call of black his work more than most in his profession is a telling indictment of supremacy. Through his multidimensional approach, he recognized and gave us a way of dealing. However, Bobby could not talk as fast as he was thinking. He tried. It seemed I was always rushing, going like a jet, going jet-like from my dear to our ideas, people on the bus of a washed Western culture. He was fire and energy, thoroughly original, possessor of a mind in a sea of lobotomized small thinkers. He focused and unsettled us in his short life. He seldom future. He knew of a death than personal, physical passing, unaware of their own promise. Dr. Wright was a thorn in the brain of black men and women posing as leaders. And many of them, he, was, he diagnosed a deep personal dishonor that disqualified them for their trusted positions. His last words were an associate. Watch the leadership, especially those proclaiming their God given, they're the God given answer, black people. Watch the leadership, especially those proclaiming their God, the God given answer to black, to black people, to the problems of black, black people. He was a fighter within the eye of the volcano, a listener in the midst of a hurricane, a lover unafraid of giving tears, a scientist seeking brilliant and moving moments, a deliverer of truth within the truth, a tree displaying roots and beauty, a good and honest man carrying wisdom and future honor to publish him. And that was from Hi R. Medu Buti. So did you want that or did you tell us what uh Mitsasar mentioned that? Or do you want me to tell you what it is? Go ahead. <laughs> no, I think you should do it. Go ahead. All right, so I have the definition. <laughs> um, so, okay, so how would you say it? He, um, he coined a term menticide, right? It's a psychological right. diagnosis, right? So it says the deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate object, ob, objective being the extirpation of that group. The deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate objective being the extirpation of that group. So he wrote, it, it's written like this. Yeah. Is it was it a typo? I'm sure it was. <laughs> All he, right. He so just heard his publisher say that his his mind was going faster than his mouth. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Oh, you saw okay. his presentation yeah, style. Like you could see him, you know, and he East St. Louis yeah. guy. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> so he had that he had that mixed with the Hobson City uh Alabama draw. You know? Yeah, he talked really fast. <laughs> I had to keep. I had to keep going back, like going back and going back. But um, funny because I think just like this guy. But 
Um, so, yeah, so basically, um, What was you about to say? So, so this is the psychological diagnosis um, on the oppressor, right? It's not Allow our diagnosis, it's theirs. Say that again. Well, this is what this is what is inflicted upon us by them. Yes. Yeah. The deliberate systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate objective being determination of that group. Right. Hmm. So this is what okay. inflicted upon us. We in, okay. Got we're it. in right. the state. We're in, so it's, it's double fold. It's Got us it. against okay. ourselves and our enemies against us as well. There so you go. Okay. We're in that state of being. All right, so that Mentally. was a clarification. And that manifest into, you know, the physical world. Wow, this is bad. Um, when it's put, but I like how it's compact and it's um and it basically explains what it is. Um, some people will will venture to say that this does not exist, but um, I know it does. So. <laughs> I just found that interesting, but yeah, I went through um, that presentation, and um, he, he went through some key points. He spoke about um, certain, um, I guess, psychologists, and um, I like how he went through um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs because I actually like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I just never thought about it the way he did. Um, and um, basically what he was saying was that, <laughs> you know, the bottom part where it tells you you need like food, shelter, you know, and sex and things like that. Um, it's kind of like the starting point before you can get up to self-actualization. But black people, we struggle with getting there. So um, if we can't have our basic needs, how are we ever going to get to, you know, the top? self-actualization. I found that interesting um, because I strive to, you know, you know, make it to like uh, the goal, which is self-actualization. So I thought that was interesting. He went through, um, he spoke about um, education and he said that education, there's a difference between education and training. He said education must come from the Black, you know, onto black people. Mm -hmm. He said training. Um, he says training operates against your best interests, and you can get that at a, I guess a, that would be college. That that paper that we all need to compete. So basically, what he said was get in there, get the training, and then, um, you know, don't argue with them, but just you know, get out of it. Um, and. Uh, because it, it is a requirement, um, getting the training. So it, it's kind of like you can't really um, avoid that in so many words. But um, he's saying that um, education, um, like professionals, I guess black professionals should have, should open up private schools that take place on the weekends to teach um, our children. And I thought that was a good idea actually and i just never seen anything like it before but that's a really good idea and i think the video was like way back right i think he said 80s i think he said 80s so yeah he was saying it back then but i have yet to see it but it's a very good idea um it was 1980 right and he transitioned two years after that at 48 years old Hmm, that's interesting. Um, he talked about what I like to talk about, which was interesting and it made me laugh a little bit. Um, white definitions, like English terminology, because I'm like really big into that thing. And um, he's saying it can't be used to explain or 
and phenomena. And I totally agree with that. So when you're speaking to black people and you're using these terms to get at them, it's just kind of pointless, really, because it's not it's not a part of our vocabulary, actually. So but if you're going to use them, use them the right way to try to explain to, you know, accurately try to use in this um, language. And he didn't go too far into the way that the English language is the devil. It, it just is. It's a big ball of confusion. Um, words, definitions of words change. One word can mean several things. And, um, and I think that's one of the things that they use also against people um, to manipulate and to, um, I guess, trick people into certain things. So if you don't know how to read, read your hand um, and read in context, you will be had, you know, by the system. So, um, so when you get into contracts, you're signing contracts, you don't know what you're reading. It, it's kind of like that. So. I thought that was interesting that he brought that up. That was a very good point. Um, he spoke about the law of nature, um, how um, a female attacks when her man gets in trouble. Like he said, that's just, just what we do. And I thought that was um, interesting because I feel like we don't get like enough credit you know, as black women, um, I think we do a lot for our sons and our husbands, especially when they get into trouble. It's like, you can't tell us anything. Um, we're mostly there to help. And um, he talks about, um, what was it, black social theory? There's, a, there's something called a black social theory. He didn't really... Um, get too much into it. What he did was he started pulling out some philosophers like um, uh, Marx, you know, Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and stuff like that, um, trying to explain um, our positions, um, I guess, in in life. It's interesting. He pulled out Karl Marx and how um, he said there's two classes of people. There's a ruling class and then a totalitarian, but we have to realize that um, Marx was a rich man, and um, it may look like he was speaking against the establishment, but I believe he was a part of the establishment, in my opinion. And uh, everything he said was true um, after the Industrial Revolution came through. And then he, he said that, and what I found out that I didn't know was that Sigmund Freud said that, <laughs> that white people in their natural state are motivated by irrational drives of aggression and sexuality. And this is through, and this is in their genetics. And they are here to threaten other species. And um, I wanted to know what you thought about that part. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think about that? We first heard that because they don't teach you this in school. And I'm not sure. I read a lot of Sigmund Freud, but not that. And um, I just thought it was it was interesting because but I've been woven into his theory. You know, uh, they gloss over him in psych. You know, when you go through general psych mm -hmm. classes and things like that, they gloss. And then they introduce the rest of the world of the psychologists and all of them bang on him but all of them still say shit like Freudian slip you yeah see what i'm saying like <laughs> so you know even when they get into counseling and dream interpretation and all of that you see what i'm saying so all of these other aspects uh, in regards to that are things that they use you know artfully and cleverly to show allegiance and it's a through line and if Freud's you know, analysis or his psychoanalytics are trash, why do you still learn them? You see what I'm saying? So you, you can see how uh, they told a line, you know, with their own indiscriminate to uh, what they might have done or said or how they're viewed in the world. You know, they can talk about them, but you cannot. You see what I'm saying? So this, <laughs> like from the outset, it's nowhere near the psychology or the cultural reference and frame of reference, these are not things that are applied to us as African people. You see what I'm saying? So they don't apply from the beginning. 
their existence is predicated off of the destruction and devastation of African people. So how then could anything that is used to keep them in a state of homeostasis and act, and act against their own nature, <laughs> which you just described, could be something that could be useful uh, in our communities and in our families. So definitely no. You understand, like, there's, there's nothing that can be used uh, from any of them in any of their ideologies, any of their political structure, any of those things that they have amalgamated and be used as any kind of models for us because we were the model that built up their models. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Like We were the experiment for uh, the uh, excusatory behavior and terminology that they crafted to describe their natural state of being. They don't need any stimuli to respond and be their normal natural self. So when you see them acting other than that, they're acting. You see what I'm saying? So he was banging on himself. Um, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I always said, I said, those people are animals. Like, I, I'm like, the, the, the stuff that went on during slavery, like, just that alone, we go back to that, which they don't really tell you about. They'll tell you in Black history, they'll hang or um, burn the crosses and, you know, in front of your house. What else? The dogs, the, the water hose. But they're not showing the the extreme uh, things that they've done, the torture and stuff like that, and and then the the yokes of iron um, that they change every so often um, that they placed on slaves and stuff like. I'm like I'm, I always say to myself, like who sits around and thinks about doing stuff like that? Like like who does that, right? So. And then it just, it never occurred to me to say, or maybe I just wasn't informed then about it. Cause I will say that I was just learned about this. I don't know, maybe for circa six years ago or something like that. Why would you want to mix that into your bloodline? You know, like that is, <sighs> should, you know, say like, I do not want that, you know, in my bloodline. I don't want to pass that down knowing that it comes from those types of people. And then when you have people from those people saying these things, because I'm sure he's not the only one. And then if you look at history, you will see, you know, I mean, it, did we for, did we really forget because, or is it from the trauma? that we, um, So I was like kind of thinking about that. But, you know, it just mm -hmm. gets me angry, you know, when I think about that. But I think he was, he was using these two, people to go into what his theories were. Um, so he calls it the black social theory. And um, he's saying, what do you do with, um, you know, cause he went through the statistics about black men and I know that we we're mostly incarcerated. Um, I wasn't aware that back then um, black males were the highest in suicide. Um, I don't know if that's covered up but every, every class that I take on university level says that black people suffer the least mental health um, um, problems and issues. I know, I know, I now know that's a lie. So, so you know, just by those um, statistics alone. So he's saying, you know, how do we deal with um, these black men? And his, in his theory, and I guess he said his solutions were to just leave them alone, give them support, re-educate them, um, restructure their personality with psychoanalysis. As that's what it, that was his business um, of doing, um, of helping in the black community. And I think it's a good one. This is great. I like the first one, leave them alone. You know, because um, I, I feel like we're being bothered to, um, I remember um, Malcolm X saying, you know, just leave us to ourselves, like leave us alone, you know, we'll have our own land and we'll do just fine. You know, you agree about, you know, protecting our civil liberties, you know, like kind of like leaving us alone and don't, you know, get your people and tell them to back off type of thing. So that kind of reminded me of that. But um, 
he went on to say that, um, talking about slavery in the system, um, whenever someone else is controlling everything that you have, you're a slave. He said, I don't mean to, you know, to, to anyone. That's what he said, but you must know that you're a slave and, and that is the truth. So, and I, I like to use that argument too. They could turn off everything, you know, in a second. And, um, and there's nothing you could do about it. He said, we have lights on in here, right? But they could turn it off from out there, you know? So you, you must know that you're in a system where you're a slave. He said, black are enslaved. Um, he said, they work all the time. And, and me working, you know, where I work, you know, in tech, but I deal with medical people. Um, there is a difference between black doctors and white doctors. And I noticed it right away. Um, they don't get any, they don't get respect like the white doctors do and they do work the most. Um, so I can, you know, co-sign that. He said, um, he got into, I guess the extermination part. So he's saying, you know, the pushing on us, pushing on us, um, the the birth control and sterilization, we're paying us to um, become sterile at a certain age um, and not have babies. Um, that's where the systematic extermination of groups is in. And he said at this part, he's at this, I guess, part in time or whatever, he says, basically you're in a race war um, if you didn't know. So this is like war on your people. Like we don't recognize it. Um, he also said, um, he spoke about the television and the psychology behind television. Um, the, the, the idiot box, we, we set our kids in front of the idiot box to have them quiet and everything, but just know that it is working on us. He said psychologists started the CIA and that's interesting. And, um, let me figure it out. Yeah, psychologist started the uh, the CIA. Um, he went into like uh, interracial. Well, because now I'm now I'm jumping, going faster because it was like an hour long, and I just wanted to touch on some uh, key things that I that I thought was interesting. He says black men and black women are chosen by white men and white women. And and I thought that was interesting. So he was like, you know, go go out and try it. He goes, go to a white person, say, I want to be with you and see what happens. And I never thought about that before. Think about that. Do you think that white people choose us versus us choosing them? Did you see Get Out? <laughs> Yeah. That talk was 40 years ago. 40 years ago. 1980. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 40 years ago. And how prophetic was it? Very prophetic. What did he say? Very. What was coming? And he started to look at all of this, all of the socialization. You see this warrior mind of a man who transitioned at 48. He would have been 46. Mm-hmm. 46, vibrant, powerful, African Senate, strong warrior who was hated, who was hated vehemently. He was very, very hated by black psychologists and his black colleagues. Mm -hmm. Hated. Mm -hmm. Hated. Mm -hmm. Yep. I can imagine. Him and uh, Bob Amos Wilson, they were both hated and they were born a week apart. Last Sunday, we was just doing this for Bob Amos Wilson. They hated them with a passion. They hated them because they were African and they could not play the, the black bourgeoisie game. They could not be bought and sold. They went against the, the norm, the normative of the situations in regards to class. You see, he broke it down with the class, the race, the, the race struggle, the class struggle to the ass struggle, like you saw the breakdown. You see what I'm saying? Because many of these people who wanted to belong to these movements and organizations 
only went into them to fuck white women. You understand? Like mm-hmm. this, this was their, their striving force. This was the force for equality. This was the, the, the force for civil rights. A lot of these men who got into these organizations. So he showed the systematic removal of the race consciousness, race first organizational foundational movement and how it changed. How they introduced drugs, how they introduced feminism, how they introduced homosexuality, all of these things in regards to weaponizing them for a deterrence against black progress, black liberation, and black solidarity. You understand what I'm saying? So introducing into the thought stream acceptable, inappropriate behavior. And he spoke about terminology. 40 years ago, he was talking about terminology. He was saying how we shouldn't use these terms. And then you hear the ones who, who purport to be about us, this, this is the terminology that they're using. They lean on this. Mm-hmm. You understand? Mm-hmm. They lean on this. So, yeah. like, this is when you're dealing with appropriate versus inappropriate. You see what I'm saying? So this whole situation in regards to these things and how that these people should not be given any kind of support of any level you know, moving in the ways that a lot of them are moving. So you see that. You see what I'm saying? You see the last words that he said to his publisher. The last words that he said to his publisher, watch the leadership, especially those proclaiming their God-given answer to the problems of black people. This is what he said. He said, watch them. You understand? How many leaders can we identify today? One, we don't have any leaders. And then two, how many of them can be identified as saying that they're God sent? You understand that that they have these answers. You understand? Like they <laughs> they are the ones. You see what I'm saying? When you so you see it creates a system of elitism. You understand? And a a, a class of servitude. A serving class to where you know uh, you're you're doing this. You see what I'm saying? So these things don't apply. So like when you look at that and you hear where he was, you can see how he was vehemently opposed and hated. But not just the enemies. The enemies respected him. It was those who sat next to him, his colleagues, who hated him, who hated his guts, and wanted him dead. Yeah, he was outspoken. Absolutely. <laughs> you, could not hide. you could not hide anymore. You could not mm-hmm. talk black and sleep white, not around him. That's yeah. your ass. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So you could no longer intellectualize or secure your space and your high tenure living high off the hog of your enemy. He had you. He was dealing with you. You see what I'm saying? So this this is a part of our nature. We don't sit by and allow injustice to happen. We are acting anti-nature, anti-life, anti-existence with this injustice that we are confronted with on a regular basis, and we haven't put anything in place in regards to implementation to eradicating these problems. They want to talk. They want to pontificate. But when it comes time for what he said 40 years ago, that we are at war. Yep. We're at war, and we don't know it. Right. How can you say it 40 years ago? You can go 400 years ago. Mm-hmm. 400 years ago and see that there were those amongst us who stood up, and they said something, and they did something. You understand? We can't say that we're from those people, and we don't follow the, the, the ways and actions and examples of those people. We're from someplace else. You see what I'm saying? We're from someplace else. Anytime you're in a situation where you can allow the death and devastation of African women and children, you're not from the same place from where our ancestral lineages come from. But if you've been societal, you long for their death. You understand? Like you actively participate and go out your way to participate in the destruction, devastation, and systematic removal of African people off the planet. That's your job. It's your job. And you do it 
Not against your will. You do it willingly. You forced in a situation where it's a psychosis. However, you follow up these ways and actions with the adherence to it. So, like, this is that whole psychosis to get out. This was made from a, the mind of a deranged man who has no loyalty to the people that he, he's attempting to exploit and to bring out in front of the world. The world stays and say, this is who these people are. And he's acting like he's doing a favor. You see what I'm saying? So when you look at this psychosis again, you see it. You see it. And it's very, very, very uh, jarring for some people because they ain't ready for none of this other stuff that we're talking about. They ain't even ready to hear this. They ain't even ready to hear this right here. So let alone talking about getting in the mud and making some 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 reciprocity happen some balance, some restoration, some reconciliation on no level. You know, we was talking about yesterday, Bible was talking about the go-alongs, the get-alongs. You see what I'm saying? And you made a differentiation between those and Negroes. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Those was Negroes that's, that's out here giving packs all and, and riddling and writing up IEP plans and things like that to further destroy a destroyed and further divide a divided people who divisive meaning by the the means and modes uh, of white family wanting white family acceptance because you heard it that he said ain't no such thing as no system you heard dr collins say there's no such thing as a system you know they talking about all oh, this is a system and operate systematically no it's a fucking family business that operates like a family business is supposed to. So when you're operating in that mind frame, in that state and space of a capitalistic type of mind frame, you you walking like scripture say up and down in the earth, seeking who you should devour, because everything's for fucking sale. You are the capital. And in a capitalist society, somebody has to make a capital gain. So that means somebody has to be exploited. So if you're talking about generations of people that were brought here to this country, whether you recognize that or not, to be a permanent underclass, to fuel a machine, a family, you see some of them images where they, they get these young children uh, from the continent, they kidnap them, and they bring them to America, and by the time they get to America, that they, they're citizens, and they're footstools for Europeans. They're bed warmers for Europeans. So the stuff they're talking about in regards to chattel slavery and the things that our ancestors did, they're doing this today, right now. You understand? They're killing African women here and selling their organs. They're killing African children and selling their organs. You understand? Like, so, so this psychosis is we can see these things. We can see, hear an alarming number like 64,000 black women missing and nobody even bat a fucking eye. You know why? You online all day looking for some sister to argue with. You, won't, you ain't got no respect for your children. You don't love them. You, it, there's no respect for the family. So how can you even you, you can't even unify in your family? Because everybody walking around with a mind in a culture they don't belong to. Because the culture dictates your mind. Your culture is your way of life. So your way of existence is predicated on what you're dealing with. So you are afforded these things from your enemy via surplus in social services in the experiment. So this is why he was talking about the CIA was created by psychologists. Only a psychologist would know how to deal with this, this military might and power. You got the largest, most technologically advanced society in the dumbest fucking society on the planet. That's by design. That is by design. Thinking people don't just go act, commit acts of atrocity. People with nothing to lose do. 
people who who don't who are not even culpable of their actions. They just go and they do. So you got emotionally charged, highly medicated zombies walking around with no regard for self or life. So they take lives. They continuously take their own life. So it becomes a fratricidal situation where we begin to kill ourselves. This is where you hear people talking about, well, what about black on black crime? Nobody ever got into the psychosis that makes somebody look in the mirror and kill their self. That's suicide. Every time you take a black life, you take your own life. Our lives are connected. We're one being. So the extermination of black life. So when he was talking about black suicide and why it goes underreported, because the numbers are so alarming on white death on the other side that they can't even compare. They can't even compare. So how many times have you experienced in your lifetime black men being killed by enemies? So desensitized. This is what media affords. Media affords you the opportunity to care less. So how many times are you going to see a video? And then you see the response. And then you downplay the response. You disrespect the, the response. So if this happens and then this causes this type of reaction, someone is doing a social experiment documenting and say, oh, okay, we can just kill them. And all they're going to do is you can fill in the blank. You can fill in the blank. We could kill them. We could kidnap them. We can rape them, we can destroy them, we can drug them up, we can disrespect them, and they're not going to say shit about it. They're not going to do anything about it. They might say something. They might get riled up. There might be some signs. There might be some hashtags. But these are all predicted outcomes by social scientists who map and chart these things out. They already know what's going to happen. And if there is some physical confrontation, it is very minuscule in the overwhelming response to that vindicator by the collective is disassociation. Straight up. Disassociation. So for a man like Dr. Bobby Eugene Wright, seeking to right the wrongs, the overwhelming response for from his colleagues and these other minds was some disassociation. That's why he said, you know, about the sister Janet in the video where he was like, she better not say, <laughs> she better not say that <laughs> he has, she has some connection to him because she wouldn't have a job no more. That's how much of a force he was. That's how much of a force he was. And he, he doesn't get rewarded and celebrated in the annals of history because he was a warrior. And he transitioned very mysteriously, just like mm-hmm. Bob Amos mentioned, very mysteriously, just like Dr. Shaka Mushbar Shango, very mysteriously. Just like Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, very mysteriously. Just like Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, very mysteriously. These things happen. And knowing that this is warfare. This is what they learn from these little places called Vietnam. This is what they learn from them little places uh, called Haiti. This is what they learn from them place, these little places like Somalia. They learn from these places. This is what they learn from Iraq and Afghanistan, how to do these things. If y'all go look up that book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, you'll see why war is always run rampant in these countries. I'm glad you said that. Destabilization, mm-hmm. all of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't know the tactics, <laughs> techniques, and procedures of your enemy, the biggest from. thing that they use 
is psychology. This is right. this is what fuels everything else. This is what a marketing campaign is. This is why you can Google something and then Facebook will show you some fucking ad. This is why you could talk about something and you'll see a, a, an ad. They are listening. They are watching. They are recording. You yep, understand? We see like, you. This is yep. how that works. This is how it works. And this is a, a propaganda campaign that is driven. They had this little uh, marketing documentary that I watched in business school. It was called Cool. And they had a bunch of grown ass people in the room, some psychologists there, some sociologists there in the room seeking how to market their products and services to children 13 and younger. The videos, all of that shit. So anything that y'all saw, uh, you know, coming out of that time, it was all manufactured. They, they showed you who the pop stars was, you know, what they were drinking, what they were eating, the clothes that they had on, all of that, all through a clever, artful campaign. And who was in the room? Not business people, psychologists and sociologists. They send people on the street they were doing. They showed this in this documentary. They sent people on the street just to be listening to what people are listening to, what people are talking about. They were going to concerts. They were going to these, these joke and, and all these other places. You see what I'm saying? And they were sitting there and they were there paid to document what the hell was going on. And they used this as their strategy planning session to mind map and to say, okay, what clever artists of liminal seduction can we use to push our agendas? So then you had an African Senate psychologist who understood these rules of this game. And he transitioned mysteriously two years after he made the video. Mysteriously, the um, political science 101, um, when uh, <laughs> when they become, um, when they have the ability to uh, gather attention of hundreds of people, thousands of people to start a movement, they have to be eliminated. So um, that's political science 101. And yeah, he had and the charisma and the rhetoric. Steve Copeland Senior, he was he was next in line right after that. You know, Bob Steve Copeland Senior was there, right there, because Dr. Bobby Wright was talking about Harold Washington, the mayor of Chicago. Steve Copeland Senior was working with uh, Harold Washington. You know, in Chicago politics. So, like, all of these things, they kind of make space to it. You see what I'm saying? And and if y'all not familiar with Bob and Steve Coakley Sr., I need to go do some research. He got about 5,000 lectures. So, anybody <laughs> saying that they're a lecturer he nowadays. Was, he was doing all that in Chicago? Oh. Yeah, Chicago and all kinds of, you know, places. Chicago is the wrong place to do it, yeah. And I've done research on Chicago politics. Um, okay. Um, so uh, he got to, not to skip ahead too far, but he got to um, his social theory. Of, he's saying that revolution is a social theory. There's several parts to it. So during his, from the time he started his presentation to the end of it, he was talking about each and every one and um, how it affects us and basically telling us the master plan behind our destruction. So he hit upon education, military, economics, uh, medical, um, political, and mental. So um, I think I covered most of them except for, okay, here we go. He, he made a comment about Black people having a higher standard of living 
And we had a conversation about this, I don't know, maybe a week or so ago. And um, the brother you and I brought it up. He said that um, we, uh, as a people, we took our money and put it somewhere else. We would make an impact on the economy because we spend a lot of money. So uh, Dr. Wright said that, I guess back in 1980, he said we were the seventh largest economy in the world, um, uh, you know, as consumers. And he said our GDP, and we're less than 15% of the um, population, it's, our GDP is $59 billion. And we were about 30 million people strong. So that's interesting. So if we withdrew and kept our money <laughs> and kept it with us, that's $59 billion back then, taken out of their hands, just keeping it for ourselves. And that would make an impact. It would. Um, that's just way too much money for us to have. So it would make a, a, a great impact um, on them. He, he went on to say that whites will do anything for money. They define and determine the value of their money. So this, this reminds me of um, when they say that we need to, um, I guess, invest in this uh, system. Uh, when we do that, is it a fair system? Um, what are we guaranteed if they get to change and, you know, it makes the paper money, right? Like, is it even worth it? So I guess what he's saying is participating, and you use that word participate, um, and that's a very important word in this system. It's, it really doesn't profit us any. So that, uh, what was the term for that when you move your money out into somewhere else? I heard you say it before, but I can't remember. Um, when we were removing the value, um, I guess our perception of value onto what we think is important instead of putting our money um, on the things, things that they put a price on. Um, so he's talking about that as an economical standpoint. Um, us dealing with them and boosting their economy. So it, that goes back to us being the capital, right? And it's for their gain, right? Okay, so he touched on that. Um, he said, now I knew exactly what he was saying when he said it because I didn't jump the gun. You know, I jump the gun sometimes, but I listened to what he was saying and I knew immediately what he was saying. He said, the religion they give you is counter revolutionary, but he didn't say that at first. He said, what he said was religion is counter revolutionary, but then he went on to explain it saying that the religion that they give you, now if you have your own thing, but if you're taking theirs, it's counter revolutionary. So I was happy to hear that, right? <laughs> and then he spoke about the bleach and cream. And, you know, even back then, the bleach and cream, I didn't think it was a thing back then. But apparently it was uh, the bleach and cream situation. And uh, he went on into his recommendations. And I guess that was the um, presentation because after that, he took the um, questions and he said, um, his, recommend, his recommendations are, and I totally agree with it, 100%, because this is the way I talk, and a lot of people I deal with, this is how they talk. Um, it, it, it may break some people's hearts, it, it, you know, um, but, but oh well, right? Um, this is for the name first. This is the way it's supposed to be. And I'm glad it was broken down this way. So now we have a place to point and say, this is the solution here. Um, Cause it's all in one place, which is amazing to me. So I got really excited to hear this. So the first one is, <laughs> the first one is, let's see. Um, we need to play in the interest. Okay, that's number one. Number two, sanction and punish the traitors. 
okay? And that's talking about us, like people that look like us. If you're going to go astray and, and try to go against what we're doing, you have to be punished, okay? And this reminds me of our scriptures, my scriptures. Um, this is like spot on with it, right? Refuse to support those who marry outside of their race. Very important. Number four, uh, make a conscious effort to darken our race. So now we're talking about skin color now. The importance of dark skin. Can we talk about that for a moment? I, I want to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> and not because you're darker, you know. What you got to say about that? About the what? importance of making us darker. Darkening, yeah. making the effort to darken the race. Yes, he said, make a conscious effort to darken mm -hmm. our race. I mean, physically, like dark. Yes. <laughs> yes. I want to know what you. I want you to give some feedback on that. It's a weapon. It's a weapon that has been used uh, against us. You know, I was just talking about it earlier. Not or, or not earlier. It was yesterday when I had the sisters on, uh, um, Tressa and Dr. Finch, and I was talking about comedians. You see a lot of the comedians um, that are darker hue. This is what it is, and they have come to grips with not being accepted by the general public unless there's some skill that's associated with it. Oh, they're funny, there's some kind of athlete. There's some kind of buffoon, some kind of fucking clown. You understand? Some court jester, any of these things right here. You see what I'm saying? This this is, you know, like a range where the darker hues are accepted. You know. So when you look at this whole concept in regards to darker skin, what industry was promoting the opposite? Who was behind promoting the opposite? You look at the entertainment industry and the entertainment industry's standard of beauty. You understand? So when you look at that psychosis within itself, you are the opposite of what is considered the norm, what is considered beauty, what is considered beautiful, what is considered successful, what is considered powerful, any of those things. So again, when you look at the Willie Lynch letter, whether it was true or not true, can you find and point to the behavior being exhibited within our society? Yes, the young versus the old, the light versus the dark, the men versus the women. It sounds like a bunch of psychologists got together and put out this document. When you start to look at these things, you know, psychologists, sociologists, you know, in this concept of individuality. So when you're looking at you, you don't see responsibility to the collective. You only think that you're, you're seeing yourself. So if you're doing something to yourself to harm yourself, you don't see how that impacts the entire collective. You know, Tupac had that song with Brenda, Brenda Scott, a baby. He said, let me show you how this affects our whole community. You understand what I'm saying? So when we look at something like skin tone, you know, where is it celebrated to be a darker hue? You understand? Like, where is it celebrated? Where, where is that? Um, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, like, this is this is my sweater. Let me show Dr. Francis Cress Wilson right here. You know, said that if she had money, 
that she said she would get all of the crystal black people on the planet and have a parade where they're honored and where they're celebrating. One of the greatest organizers and, and minds who Dr. Bobby Eugene Wright was connected to was the Honorable Marcus from Zion Garvey. And they called him an ugly little dark man. Some people called him a monkey. You understand? So when you start looking at what's associated, and he galvanized millions of people towards universal improvement. Universal improvement. So as a psychiatrist, she recognized in order to challenge those delusions that exist, you had to use cognitive behavior techniques to celebrate that. You remember the doll test. We ain't even got to go there. You can remember the doll test. You see this social programming and what's associated with beauty. So now you're looking at a servant underclass, a permanent servant underclass that is divided by divisive tactics even further. So the light ones versus the dark ones. You know, I was talking about that African-American identity crisis with the film Antoine Fisher. And in the movie, Derek Luke, who was supposed to be Antoine Fisher's character, said Keith was half white. He said sometimes he wished he was Keith. He wanted to be Keith. He did not want to be who he was. So look at this man who wasn't the same complexion as his character, but look at what he was saying and screaming from his being. So if you're talking about a total shift in thought in regards to the unification process, it's not to cause further division. Is for the focal point to come back to this original state of being. This. So uh, a celebration and honor to the, the sacredness of our ancestral look that way of being to present yourself in a fashion where there is no question, where there is no doubt. Thank you <laughs> for saying that. And that's the, that's the key. That is the key rights matter. Um, I'm not going to say unfortunately. Fortunately, it does matter. Um, so I'm re I'm reading the chat right now, and somebody made hi Big O. Um, somebody made a comment about wait a minute, what was it? Let me go up. He's it came from Facebook. It said pain to the infidels. That's real heavy. Didn't I stay on too long? Dipped in and out real fast. Um, that's because I don't want to get angry. <laughs> so I'll just say that. Um, but I'm going through his recommendations, Bobby E. Wright, Dr. Bobby E. Wright's recommendations um, regarding. Listen um, to the rest because it, get, it gets way better. You know, it gets way better. <laughs> yeah, it, it does get it does get way better. So it's our fucking constitution right here. <laughs> exactly, everything is all in one place. This is like amazing because, um, you know, sometimes we get looked at like we're crazy for saying for looking at someone and saying you know like and, and, and asking questions because you just don't look like me and that's okay to ask those questions it's also okay to reject that and i'm gonna say that um it, there's trust issues if we're at war so we need to make sure that we that they were all on the same page um but that that's something that i want to talk about in the future um, regarding that, regarding um, race and mixing and things like that, but that's for another day. But according to this, there's none of that. So over here, number five, no leaders cannot marry outside of their race. So if you have leaders, people who are coming in as leaders and they marry outside of their race, that's a no-no. So it's also a no-no for the leaders. No should ever be considered for leadership right in the black community 
who date right. outside their race, who marry outside their race, mm -hmm. who have sex outside of their race. None. No, no one. No one, right. he said. No one. He said, no one. <laughs> no one. <laughs> you know, and I know people will say, you know, there's no pure. When I look and I see black people look like me, I consider that to be pure. So I'm looking at you. We we go through the same things. We understand each other. We understand each other's language. Uh, uh, I question you about... Uh, uh, your error and you can answer questions then you're just like me right so <laughs> um that's cool so the leaders you're off limits for doing that so stop it number six stop using negative words well if i could say if i could say something about the leadership you know uh -oh. we were talking about <laughs> 21 questions um uh, we're gonna so back it up back to number five yeah, like, like no one no one should be in a leadership position in the black community who hasn't gone through some kind of torture, torture. and rites of passage, Amen. leadership <laughs> program to be in a position to have any kind of say about the future of black people there you go. Uh, and the sanctity of black families. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. There's mm -hmm. no evidence. We don't believe you. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And you can't be trusted otherwise. Right. You can't be trusted otherwise. You like, will be like Dr. Bobby Eugene Wright went through hell for black people. And there's millions of black people who don't even know his name. Who don't even know his name. So when you hear this criterion, and then when certain people are brought up and you hear me, don't say anything. Oh, I say, um, I, I could do without that. It's because of this criteria and more. There more there's more criteria, you know. This this is our constitution. It's our fucking constitution. Right right. Now. You know yep. right. So no nobody like you can't lead no nation. This is what I was going back to. You can't lead no black nation without going through no torture. You think you no know, no test, no no trial, no tribulation. What you where you think you're about to lead some black people? And you you ain't even passed the first test. You confused about who you love and where your loyalty lies. Like you think you have a decision on your own. Talk about it. Decision on your own. <laughs> <laughs> choose this right here like that shit don't work that shit don't yep. work where you mm -hmm. think i'm killings came from you think oh it came from some fucking arab or some shit like that no no, no. you you got excommunicated or you got done in now this is the 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 litmus test of your society to be able to reward or punish this is the society. This is this is the proof of your society. The, the set ability to reward or punish. So if you know certain things is going on in your society and you let that shit have a pass, you're guilty by fucking association. So when that shit get clinked up, you get clinked up with it. <laughs> that was that part in you know Black Panther. That was the shit. Uh, what, what's his name? The copy was like. Hey, if you just want us to go out there and you know clean up, we could go do that. <laughs> I said, "Well, copy on it, you know, like it wasn't like." But look at their job. Their job was to protect the border. They That's had a right. different kind of situation mm -hmm. in regards to the the social climate of the society. They had to protect the border. Mm -hmm. They didn't make no qualms when Inchidaka walked up with that dead body. It wasn't like they was like, huh. Oh. My goodness, job. His father, <laughs> he said in the movie, and his parents was killed protecting the border. You see what I'm saying? He had a different way of being than everybody else that was out there. That's right. So you look at that in the socialization, you saying you about to go lead a nation. Y'all watched the damn movie and said the movie was good. He had to engage in ritual combat, life or death. You yield or you die. 
for the throne. <laughs> Just go up to the throne like, yeah, my father said I'm next in line, son. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah. He had to shed some blood. That's right. He had to be prepared to give his life or take a life. Dirty work. Yep. How the hell are you going? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Omar told him in the book, he said, I was loyal to your father. He was the king. He said, I am your king now. You understand? That's right. He had to remind him. He had mm -hmm. to remind him. See, mm -hmm. Itzadaka wasn't having that shit. He seen all the punk shit that was going on. And he was like, when I say some shit, I mean it. I'm not the last motherfucker. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> I'm not that last motherfucker. He said, burn that shit. So you seen everything burnt up. <laughs> and she said that shit on fire. He was like, I'm not going to tell your ass again. That's a different situation. You, you ain't got no diplomat over here. We here for this war. And this is what Wakabi was like. Yeah, finally, we got some, you got some shit going on. You got your orders to get them planes in there. I don't give a fuck about that challenge shit. He said that challenge shit was over. I'm telling you, that was one of the best fucking characters ever created. Cause that's another part. That's the deep depths of our soul. Like we, like this is a part of our character. Don't tell me you 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 come from people like Nat Turner and Will the Executor, and you got some fret in your heart about what's supposed to be done. <laughs> the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> they heard they hung Nat Turner and they hung Mary Turner. Why they ain't talking about Mary Turner? The city erupted. The city erupted after them four little girls were killed and firebombed in that damn church. Right. Erupted. They firebombed Martin Luther King's house twice. The city erupted. They wasn't out there playing. They was tearing motherfuckers out of the frame. Everybody showed up with guns to his house and he sent them home. Everybody. That march on Washington was bloody hell before it became peaceful and they were singing on some goddamn bridge. We don't come from no punks. We don't come from no punks, man. I don't know who y'all think we come from. That disconnect that we got in regards to our ancestral lineage, we don't come from no punks, man. Say it again. Come from no punks. <laughs> Like you, you, we, we grew up scrapping and the, the generation after us came out shooting out the door we don't we don't know no punks we don't know no punks this is why they want you effeminized mm -hmm. with this burnt up hair with fucking dresses on because they don't want you out there reciprocating adjudicating they want you with, with this chump stuff Want this chump stuff going on? You understand what I'm saying? And they ask them about solutions. You know the fucking solutions. Yeah. You know them. Yep. You know them. You don't yep. need no blueprint. You don't need no book for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> even though you got a blueprint, even even though you got a book. And anybody who's saying they're about to lead you and they, they ain't ready to do none of that, we don't need to have no fucking conversation. None. You don't qualify. So even just back to that 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 foundational point, who you chose to unify ancestors with, they say everything. And then to reproduce and recreate from that essence right there says everything they say everything about your allegiance you ain't gotta tell me shit tell me nothing one i don't want to hear it and two i already know let me talk about solutions like yeah man you know we know the problems no you don't know the fucking problems they're like, we know what our enemies have done. You got no fucking clue what they've done. This is what they've done. You see, this sister, she on this shirt. She went into the hospital. They knew who the fuck she was, and she didn't walk out of that motherfucker. She did not walk out. Mm -hmm. Dr. Savy died in jail. 
Mm-hmm. We got political prisoners right now, black political prisoners right now, yep. suffering and dying in jail. Yep. What's the solution? Don't say a silent name and you asking me what's the fucking solution. <laughs> we don't come from no punks. How you looking for no a solution punks, if you're like, dead? If you don't understand that you're not at war, you have to understand you're at war first, and then you start looking for solutions. <laughs> and, no, we not punks. See, that's what I'm oh, man. And no, we're not punks. Um, he talked about it. He said that uh, there's laws of nature. The law of nature. And, and we're naturally warriors. Right. Okay? It's in our history. Right. Right. All right. So if we start, so if we size you up, you know what I'm saying. We trying to figure out, you know, if we should take you into this fold. <laughs> we try to figure you out. We need some time. Let's, you know, fill you out for a minute. You know, and that's okay. That's okay. And you, you see know? the detriment too, just real quick, uh, of the film. His father killed his brother. And the character Black Panther killed his cousin. And they both ain't killed on white people that was responsible. Mm. You understand? Mm. They let them live. Mm. They let them live. Mm. They let mm. them live. Mm. And they helped them. <laughs> they repaired it. Uh, you see the psychosis? You kill your own family. You could kill your own family. It was natural. I watched the movie and I was so disgusted when they had the brothers and sisters on the battlefield fighting each other and trying to kill each other. It looked too natural. Nobody was even bothered by that shit. I heard all of the breakdowns, all of that. Nobody said shit about it. Because it looked natural. see it, right? And that was probably the reason why I didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I refused to see it, to watch it. I refused. Because I knew it was going to be some mumbo jumbo. Fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And then. They let the enemy Yo, live, they, really? Hmm. I mean, this is like this this is what happens. Historically, this is what happened. Yes. This ain't no shit they just made up and threw in a movie. It's a recreation of real life history. Mm -hmm. Haiti gets free in 1804. And they let the enemies leave. <laughs> they let them leave. Not all of them. But they let them leave. They gave them provisions. They gave them a boat to leave. When you let them leave, what happens? They come back and take your shit. Thank you go with that, but I digress. <laughs> that I digress. Shaka Zulu, Shaka Zulu mama said, never will he leave an enemy behind. And he said, right. never leave, it, leave an enemy right. behind because it'll rise again to fly at your throat. Yep, yep. Absolutely, Damn. absolutely. When so you're at you war, about rules, right? After that, you was you was talking about the other rules, right? What was you about to say? My bad. <laughs> no, we gonna no. I'm gonna move on because you know we get emotional. You sure? <laughs> I'm getting very, very strategic. I get very, very emotional. strategic and not emotional. I'm. I'm well, you could get emotional. I'm, I'm being very strategic. Strategic, all right. <laughs> this is a feminine energy over here. Um, <laughs> all right, so number six. <laughs> number
Can you hear me? Sass, can you hear me? Yeah, I can't hear nothing. If you're saying something, I can't hear you. I don't know what's going on. Can y'all hear me? Uh, so I said they can't hear you. You can hear me. I don't know if you can hear me or not. All right. She about to come back in. Let me read this from Esther O'Reilly. Can you hear me now? Yeah, they hear you now. Hmm. <laughs> in the inner room. No, because uh, Big O said he couldn't hear me, so the problem was my side. So, because I could hear you. You could hear me. Yeah, I could hear you, but you couldn't hear me. Oh. And then the confirmation came from O. Um. Shalom, Big O. Shalom. Sorry. So you about to read um, number? You about to read number six, right? Number. Oh, okay. That's where you. Just didn't hear me okay stop using negative yeah. words for black so uh for example the n-word <laughs> the k-word um the t-word you know what the t-word is um i don't hear too many people using that word anymore the k-word i hear a lot the n-word i hear a lot um usually i guess it's like uh, uh increasing our respect for each other when we speak to each other you know, removing those negative words. Um, that did we have anything? Uh, we didn't come up with those words for ourselves, did we? No. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, uh, expose children to positive black images, and he's talking about uh, uh, professionals, um, black professionals. I guess educated ones to, te to teach his children in independent um, locations, like on the weekends when they're not in regular school. I guess is to, um, because uh, that's where you get the education from. He made a difference between education and training. Education own, so that's important. So, um, big O, you said knowledge is not power, but guess what? Black knowledge is power. Okay, so we'll put it like that. Um, number eight, <laughs> number eight, um, black art that shows strong black images. So you want to show the images because he used the example of the white Jesus. We used to sit in church and fan ourselves with the white Jesus, the flapping in your face. <laughs> I had to laugh at that because, oh my God, I remember doing that. Uh, and not asking any words, but um, I know we had a white Jesus in our house. I got rid of that, like, I don't know, six years ago out of my grandmother's house. I was like, okay, this this guy has got to go. Um, but, you know, we never questioned that image. It was, it's weird. Why would our guy be someone else or, you know, look white? You know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So I remember good times when they had the black Jesus on the wall and people were getting upset about that. Like, why would they um, make Jesus uh, black like that? And um, I think it's a good thing to me. To me, it's to me. I don't believe in that. But if that is who you pray to, well, but I, you know, if that makes you happy, at least it's not some white, what, like uh, my elders call a hippie on a stick. Okay, <laughs> you know, as long as it's not that, <laughs> if it's not that hippie on a stick image, you know, it's all good. So, yes, yeah, so black art, black images of our leaders, our revolutionaries, um, our doctors, our educators, uh, uh, all of these people. 
Um, I think that, you know, on your vision board, because I have a vision board of goals I want to achieve, I also have Black leaders up there. Um, for instance, my favorite writer is Zora um, Neale Hurston, um, Black conservative. Um, yeah, propped up, you know, in the Harlem Renaissance, but to me, I like the way she spoke. She's very blunt. Uh, what she meant what she meant she didn't you know uh she she spoke against white supremacy um she went to columbia university so she was trained um properly but she had black education and i can tell from, by the way she wrote in all of her novels and things like that so i keep her up there i also keep um um pam greer up there because she's just beautiful actress or right um grace jones because everybody has stolen from her brilliant fashion sense, right? Everybody has stolen from her, including, you know, Madonna, who they praise. That all came from Grace. And um, another one that I have is um, Julia Hare. She was an activist, a black activist, and um, which no one really talks about. And um, she, she used to be celebrated as well. I believe she died like a couple of years ago from Alzheimer's, but she was very big on um, propping up and um, supporting the black man um, in our community and, um, you know, working together as a unit, as man and uh, as man and woman. And, uh, you know, she she was one of those people that encouraged the black man to, to do more, to be more in like this very uh, 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 gentle way that I've never seen before, especially, you know, us under stress and trauma and us fighting each other. She, she had a whole different approach and, and I was rocking with that. Um, how to deal with our children today. She has solutions for those things. And the list goes on and on with her. So she's on my vision board. And, um, and I think that we all need to, to kind of remind ourselves of, um, our leaders. I know that Knowledge Board Allah does it all the time. He memorizes birthdays and death dates, and he can run down kind of like any Black leader or revolutionary, basically. And, and I find that amazing. So um, if we keep it on our minds, we won't forget. And that's the problem. We always forget. And I know the scriptures talk about it. You know, we need to write this down. <laughs> we need to look at this and not forget our culture, not forget our language, not, you know, um, forget our constitution um, uh, and not forget um, our ancestors, um, why we're here, why we exist. So um, these eight things were his recommendations and I think it's brilliant. And I, I, I think that's it. That's the plan right there. Got it? Got it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so there you go. And, um, you know, it's, you know, propping up these um, entertainers is just useless, in my opinion. Um, a lot of them are our people, but they're, they're uh, according to this list, um, they violate, they violate number one, number two, number three, <laughs> number four, <laughs> number five, six, damn, seven, they violate all everything in here. So them, you throw them, throw them in the trash. So do you um, remember those entertainers that he named? Yes, <laughs> the traitors. Yes, and I, I think I said it on a pass. No, no pass. Absolutely not. <laughs> so now, do you understand? He was like, "I know you don't like Ozzy Davis." <laughs> do you understand? Well, I well well Ozzy Davis, I wasn't aware of uh of what was going on with him, but you educated me on that. See the importance of education, right? Black education, right? There's a lot of 
people I don't like either because of certain things, but I wasn't aware of uh, Isaac Davis, who was adored. Yeah. Some people all throughout the black community. When, they wouldn't fuck with me for that, you know. So <laughs> I care less. I could. You know. They need to be they thrown in the trash. Me, yes, all of them should be thrown in the trash. Um. So, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Read, let me read this from his wife, Esther O'Reilly. Dr. Bobby E. Wright was a black psychologist, so labeled not just because he was both black and a psychologist, but because he used his education, training, intellectual knowledge, and skills always in the best interest of black people. He, he had a philosophy of commitment, accountability, and service to the black community. Indeed, his life was one of love and dedication to the liberation and race vindication of all people of African descent. To this end, he wrote, lectured, and taught as an active participant in the Black liberation struggle. Dr. Wright was born in one of the oldest all-Black communities in the United States, Hobson City, Alabama. He attended both elementary and high school there. His grandfather was one of the founders of Hobson City. These events undoubtedly contributed to his positive self-image and race consciousness. His professional career was outstanding. He was a truant officer, a teacher, a school psychologist, mental health administrator, clinical psychologist, researcher, consultant, author, and computer expert. He was known locally, nationally, and internationally for his technical skills, as well as his commitment to the progress of black people. He believed in the sanctity of the black family and his dedication to his wife and son were exemplary. At the time of his death in 1982, Dr. Wright was director of Garfield Park Comprehensive Community Health Center in Chicago. Under his leadership, his mental health center, which now bears his name, became the largest totally black control, freestanding mental health center in the United States. Long live the spirit, memory, and inspiration of Bobby E. Wright. I love that guy, even though he's gone, you know. But he's still a teacher of mine. He's became a teacher of mine. It's like how my words that are teacher, said. Who I never met. Yes. Yes. Do you hear the words that were said? I heard them. Do you see how many people that this disqualifies? <laughs> Oh, man. Like they, they're in positions of influence because we don't have any leaders, so it's not any leadership right. position. But right. in the sphere and the span of influence, look how many people that this disqualifies. And he was not looking to be grandized or anything like that. He just was an African who cared about African people, who cared about the, the, the mind and spirit and essence of our people. I used. You, you see, it's at the sanctity of the black family. He believed in the sanctity of the black family. <laughs> he believed in the sanctity of the black family. I'm. Let me get that English word real quick because, um, they use that word in the uh, scriptures as well and it's one of those words that um, people don't really understand they don't understand what it means when it says go to sanctify, book, right? I sanctify go ahead go ahead Big O you see that 
the psychopathic <laughs> racial personality and other essays. So this is how you can learn. You can go on YouTube and check out a couple of his videos, but get the book, get into his mind and get the rest of these books uh, from thought leaders who came after him. Let me see how many pages is in this book. Because one of these days, it's going to be a wrap. One of these days, I'm going to deal with this subject right here. In depth. I'm going to deal with it. And I'm going to deal with all of the advocates. With all of the fucking excuses. I'm going to deal with it. <laughs> I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with it. All right. It's 715 pages in this book. 715 oh. pages. Wow. Mm. He got busy in you that book. This? You, see you see this? You see this? This ain't for the book challenge, okay? I ain't holding it up to my damn ear. <laughs> so for the Trump who got all the excuses in the world and all of that shit, don't show up that day. Don't show up. Don't show up. Sanctity is a noun. Holiness of life. Okay, which means holy means. Yep. So it's to be holy. That that family is to be set apart. The black family from everyone else. Which means uh, black first. Which means um, nation first. Um, and you know. Uh, don't allow people to guilt you into thinking that's a bad thing because it's not. Because they do it for themselves and their own people. And, and we should do it for ourselves. Period. Sanctity. Yes. Be ye holy as I am holy. Right, O? Let me read a little bit of this essay. Since Big O ain't gonna spend eight ninety five <laughs> on this book. <laughs> oh you dollars and ninety five cent. You're not gonna spend eight dollars and ninety five cent on this book. <laughs> You're gonna try to YouTube the book. You want to try to find the PDF for free online? You know. Let me read a little bit. A psychopathic racial personality. I was reading this book. I was reading this book. I wrote some papers on this book. One day I find it. Maybe I'll read a little bit of what I wrote. I was reading this book. And I went home on my 25th birthday. And I was home. And I was with my mama and my older brother. And I was like, we're going to go have some drinks. And my mama said, what? <laughs> Nigga, you drinking? Oh, hell yeah, we going out. That's what my mama said. So, we were supposed to meet up there like immediately, but we fucking with my brother. And we got up there like two hours later. You know? <laughs> And my mama popped up out of nowhere. This, that was like my mother's place, you know, in Orange, the private place. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. So, you know, that old head spot, and my mother knew the owner and all that, you know. She, <laughs> you know, um, got a lot, a lot of clients from there, you know, and... You know, the barmaid, stuff like that. One of the barmaids, her name was Adrena. 
And she gave me my first book on the Black Panther Party. She gave me that. She was like, I heard you're a little revolutionary. (laughs) (laughs) And she gave me that book, you know. She gave me that book. And it started me on that path um, into the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And, you know, years later, not that many, but a few years later, it got me into the new Black Panther Party for Self-Defense under the leadership at that time of that shiny bald head warrior, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. And I was reading this book right here. I was home, 25th birthday out there partying with my mom. And there's an older gentleman there who was after my mama. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, he was seeking some courtship with my mama and he tried to approach her, it was crazy. And I looked at that man and she said, don't worry about it. You've been trying to get me for 30 years. (laughs) So I said, all right, as long as you got it, because if I have to get it. (laughs) You won't be pretty. She said, shut up and keep on partying. You understand? I said, shut up. Worried you about like what you worried about. You sound like you know, so she's like, what you, <laughs> what you worried about? She didn't say what you gonna do because she know. Yeah, yeah. She knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, we party and whatever, and she's like, oh, this is my son. He's in the military and blah blah blah, and this, and he just came back from Iraq and. No, she she was talking like that, mm-hmm. talking that shit. And I really was home from my rack, mm-hmm. literally, from the battlefield. It was fun. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I ain't pay that dude no mind because I just only only mind I would have had was to handle that business if things went south. <laughs> so I wasn't really paying him no mind. So she was like, "Oh, he wants to buy us a drink." I ain't taking no fucking drink from this dude. You know. And now I'm good. I buy him a drink. Buy me no drink. (laughs) So, you know, we go into the night, pay the tab, go to this diner. We all drunk. I'm drunk. My mom's drunk. We had a good time. We getting there partying. I forgot that dude exists. She was like, "He want to buy us breakfast." My older brother done left and shit. Done left me out there. So I'm like, now I gotta make sure my mother get home. You know what I'm saying? And we go to East Orange Diner. What is it? East Orange Diner? Or is it Orange Diner? What is that damn diner called? Do you remember? What street? Up the street by that church or whatever. Main Street. In East Orange? Oh, Main Street. Okay. Yes, yes. Main Street. <laughs> um, yeah, you have to tell me the street. Yes. You have to tell me the street. Yeah. So up there, I think it's East Orange down there. Right there. He said, it. Big O said Orange. It's called Orange Diner. He says orange. What big old from? I don't know nothing about what I'm talking about. You don't know. You have to have, look. It's a oh, lot of people in, around me. That's on. That's in these YouTube streets. <laughs> oh, you want to lay? Don't, don't tell me yeah, where see, you're he from. Said, see, he said facts. See, it's to. orange. Let me Google it. Let me see if it's East Orange. 
Yeah, you don't need to Google it. It's, it's orange. I know it's orange. I'm just talking shit. It's but I'm orange. The name oh, of the, okay. the diner. Okay. It's, I'm it's talking Americana. about the name of the diner. I ain't saying Americana. Which. Americana. That's what it's called today. What the fuck is it called? Americana. That's what it's called today. I don't hear that shit. Okay. <laughs> East Orange Dino. Whatever. Yes. Okay. So we have up in there and the owner comes, you know, my mother know everybody. So she's like, Oh, where's the owner? So the owner come out there and she said, Oh, this is my son. The one I was telling you about, he speaks Arabic, you know. <laughs> and the dude just sitting next to us, he's bugging. We are done drunk. Like, we not just drunk, we done drunk. I was drinking 151, all kind of shit, just everything mixed together. None of that. And my mother was looking, she was like, you was drinking vodka, then you start drinking gin, then you start drinking 151, and then you was drinking some tequila. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> so we up in there and we done for my mother done for my mother was drinking since we left her till we <laughs> met up with her and then all the way to the night. I think I gave her like twenty dollars and when I got there she still had that twenty dollars. She was like, "I still got that twenty. <laughs> I ain't spent shit yet." I was like, "Oh!" <laughs> and she was drinking that tequila, that eighteen hundred tequila, that that dish. Not the 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 calm, nice eighteen hundred. That gutless shit that only God could drink. You know, so she was drinking that shit all night. It ain't. Spend no money. <laughs> That's how you do it. That's how you and do it. we didn't have no tab. It was just a tip. She was like, "Leave her." That's good exactly tip. how you. We ain't got no tab. <laughs> we ain't got no tab. So I'm like, I dropped the money on the on the thing. I was like, "All right." Shit. So we in this diner, and the owner come out, and. He talking to my mother and he's trying to talk to me. And I told him in Arabic, don't give me none of this shit you serve these other people. <laughs> Cause I fuck you up. That's what I told him. And he looked and I went back to English smiling, talking to my mother. And this dude that's trying to get with my mother, he done heard me speak Arabic. He didn't hear me speak English. He don't know what the hell I did say. <laughs> so the dude, he go back and make my food. And he make my food out. So the dude is tripping because I'm sure these people done went to this diner before. And they ain't get none of this service. And the owner ain't come out to talk to you or none of that shit. So we talking some shit back and forth. And I'm laughing, my mother laughing, and this dude trying to laugh because he, he can't really follow the conversation. <laughs> so he just there with his well wishes, and he's sitting there. And I told you I was reading this book, and there was some elders that was behind me, and they were conversating. And normally, I don't pay attention to people's conversation. And I heard one guy talk to this other guy about masonry. And the elder was like, hey, I don't know nothing about it. More power to you. And instead of the guy just leaving it alone, he started to berate the dude because he didn't know nothing about masonry. You know, most people don't know. You know, so... He was talking shit. And I heard that and I'm listening. I was like, this fucking slave right here. Yeah, it pissed me off. And I remember going back to this part right here. And it says, in a bullfight, 
after being brutalized by making innumerable charges at the movement of a cape. There comes a time when the bull finally turns and faces his adversary with the only movement being his heaving bloody sides. It is believed that for the first time, he really sees the matador. This final confrontation is known as the moment of truth. For the bull, this moment comes too late. So this passage right here describes our sojourn in the, in the creature comforts that we have grown so accustomed to and the technological advances that we've grown so accustomed to in exchange for our minds, our hearts, and our beings, and the minds and hearts mm -hmm. and beings of our children. So when I heard this dude mm -hmm. talking, and he was talking to this guy as if he had something of worth and value, and instead of him sharing it with him to uplift him, to put him on, he was using it to berate him and to disrespect him. Mm -hmm. And I don't use the term slave. Mm -hmm. I say my ancestors, I say our ancestors, but I was like, this fucking slave right here thinks that he has some information, and because he thinks he has access to some information, like I turned right around and I was talking to my mother about this slave that was behind me, and I really don't even get disrespectful with elders right here. So my mother is laughing. Again, this guy is sitting right next to us, right behind us. Talking this noise to somebody who's supposed to be his friend. Mm -hmm. Somebody yep. who would be. And he's disrespecting him and insulting his intelligence because he did something that the other dude didn't do. Mm -hmm. And this guy that's there that's you know, trying to get with my mother, he is in the 60s. So he's here, he's listening to me talk to my mother about the situation. And I'm like, you know what I hate? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So my mother don't about to go all the way through that. So I started, you know, having a conversation and I'm breaking it down and I'm talking about this book to my mother. And this dude is sitting there. Mind you, we is shit face drunk. You understand? Mm. So the set ability, you already seen me speaking Arabic to the dude and then speaking English to my mother, then hearing this dude, then got a whole nother other situation right there. And then come out of it and be talking about how sad this is about this situation with this matador and the bull. They shocked the bull, they stabbed the bull, they have the running of the bulls through the city. And they take the bull's testicles, they castrate the bull. And we look at this and we think that this is some kind of amusement. No, this is us. The ritualized killing and sacrifice and destruction of us every single day. This was the buck that was in the road and get out. And when he walked into the house, he seen the bull. He's like, he seen the deer, I mean, not the bull, the deer. And they told him that they had hit a deer and he said, oh, did you kill it? He was, he was, you know, infatuated by that. And this dude was supposed to be comfortable in the spot anyway. It says the black, the experience of black people all over the world presents an analogous situation. For hundreds of years, black people have been charging at the banners that are held by European white matadors. Those banners have been represented by concepts such as democracy, capitalism, Marxism, religion and education, the banners remained constant as long as blacks were assets. However, 
with technology and worldwide industrialization on the rampage, resulting in a, a further exploitation of Africa's resources, which in turn produce an increase in Africa's Blacks' national consciousness. Blacks are now a threat and a liability to the white race. This book was written in 1979. Therefore, the banner held by the matador represents only one concept, genocide. As a consequence, the major research that white scientists are involved in today is genocidal in nature. Nuclear warfare, population control, medication control, genetic engineering, psychosurgery, electrical stimulation of the brain, and the highly complex science of behavioral technology. Indeed, it is Black's moment of truth. It is time for Blacks to look at the matador. So I was given this information to my mother. She didn't need it, and she knew it. So I'm just, you know, relating this information in regards to this experience because this has become another thing that you're charging at in regards to the matador. So I'm there and I'm talking about the situation and I'm relating it to this book and this experience and to the elder that's behind me. And I'm like, you, like you're thinking that you got something. You got nothing. It's an illusion. So this matador is holding this cape. So this experience of this heaving, massive bull that can easily destroy this matador is at this matador's mercy. Mm-hmm. Yep. And right at this final charge, this bull charges to its death. This bull is beheaded. Pieces of the bull are sold to the oncomers and the tourists. This is the ritual death and sacrifice of the black family to the world. People travel from the entire planet to see this happen. So to get the corticals, what is it? The corticals of rush of adrenaline escaping the bull. Yep. How many times do we see this play out? So this is what I'm telling you, you know, and <laughs> the, dude, the dude is sitting next to my mother like, I've never heard anyone speak the way you speak. And I looked at my mother and my mother laughed. I said, what? Me? I said, how old are you? He's like, I'm in my 60s. I said, man, you was alive when Malcolm was alive. What the fuck are you talking about? Where were you? Where, where were you? What was she doing? <laughs> I said, Malcolm was here. Malcolm was here in New York City. What are you talking about? You talking about me? I said, okay. Since you said that, I'll, I'll share something with you. I said, everybody loved Malcolm. I said, but Malcolm had a teacher. I said, Malcolm had a teacher that was able to shape and mold his mind in a certain kind of way and to deal with his psychology in a certain kind of way. And made him a powerful weapon that the world hated. I said, Sir, I'm Malcolm. My mother is Elijah. I said, So if you're not ready, to handle Malcolm, what the hell are you going to do with Elijah? 
And I just busted out laughing and went back to eating my food. So my man got up, he paid for the meal. He said, uh, respectfully, I am not qualified. <laughs> and he went on about his fucking business, you know. So that's one of them fond memories of this book right here. And and uh, Bobby, Bobby E. Wright spoke about all those things you talked about right there: the technology, the um, genocide, and um, and we talked about some of that stuff yesterday, last night, right? Yeah. Right. About colonialism organization, which is one and the same. Yeah. Big O says we all been hurt and don't know who to trust. Bottom line. Exactly. Well, we need to be okay. we need to be cautious. We need to be cautious about who we let into our circles. Don't trust me. Do that seraph shit with Seraph did in Neo in part two. He's like, you could have just asked now. No. Got to size you up and fill you out for a minute, you know? You just don't get to come in. Don't you know someone until you fight them. (laughs) 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 Black suicide. Lynching by any other name is still lynching wasn't that after named after the man hated it who what was his name i can't remember his first name something lynch Lynch. yes william lynch (laughs) yeah that yeah that one this is a short read but this is so powerful I would read the whole thing, but it's already been two hours, and <laughs> big old I don't buy the book. <laughs> oh. He said he was a little deeper than you two. <laughs> if he can't read my name on the screen right here, because he done called me the wrong <laughs> name the whole entire time. He if did? he can't read my name on the screen, he's not going to read the book. Look, look what it says. No, Who is that? He, he said it right. Who's that? He said it right. Who is that? What is, what is that? That's the alternative that? name. Well, that's another <laughs> one. Read, nigga, read. <laughs> hey, read. You read. You're telling me to read, but he can't read my name on the damn screen. And I said it at the beginning of the broadcast. he been wilding out about his name all week. Oh, you've been gone. he been wilding out. Everybody been. You know, even if he's not there, my bad. Now it's spoiling a lot. My bad. <laughs> it's simple. It's right there on the fucking screen. It's right here. It's right here. <laughs> I ain't reading. We out of here. Cass, what you got to say before we go? This big old can't read. <laughs> he's telling you to read. He's telling me to read. I'm to read. the reader in, in the camp. Read. <laughs> read. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, wait a minute. Hold up. Man, what you about to say? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you. Gonna take off. <laughs> hold up. Hold up. He's about to get banned because he can't read. <laughs> you better learn how to uh read. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me get it. Let me get it before I say um before I say shalom. <laughs> <laughs> before I say it. Okay, here we go. So Deuteronomy 7 and 6. <laughs> Deuteronomy 7 and 6. That's right. For thou art a holy people. <laughs> For thou art a holy people unto the most high thy power, 
The Most High, thy power has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people. The face mm. of the earth. Okay? All right. So we need to remember that. Uh, we are a holy people, a special, a special people. Okay? And that's talking about us and nobody else. So, sorry. If you that's know. right. That's right. So, um, that's all I wanted to say. So, now, shalom. And, and peace, peace to uh, the late Dr. Bobby E. Wright. I'm feeling, I'm feeling him. You know, that's the ancestor. I'm feeling him. I mean, this, this is it. This is right. This is the epitome of myself right here. You know, this topic and this other topic right here is what reveals the chumps right here. This. <laughs> And dealing with the psychology of black people brings out the chumps, the apologetics, the suckers, uh, the rats, the snakes, the mixed multitudes and shit. Uh, we don't <laughs> give a fuck about you. Said, oh, he said mixed multitude. Fire, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fire. This is Shots fired. When they start talking that. Shit. This is when they come out like, well, you can't help who you love, who you fall in love with. What? <laughs> what the fuck are you saying? Uh, it's time to go. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> oh, got the flames up. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I just felt in my heart just now. Flames. <laughs> they start talking that shit, and then you'll find some apologetists who don't even know that they're being apologetists <laughs> in their heart. Yeah, and then the meanies like me come out and and, and knock that down. All right, tearing down your altars. They start and telling me the what I can't say. They yeah, start telling yeah. me what I can't say. They start telling me what you can't say. You can't say that. Yeah, you can't. How could you just say that? <laughs> Hate is a strong word. They start talking all that shit. Cry aloud, like Yahoo said. Cry out aloud. Uh, aloud. Spare not. You thought <laughs> Big O, you yeah. missed it. Yeah, me Yahoo went crazy yeah. the other night. Uh, we ain't even saying that shit again. I'm, if I find out how to edit that part out, I edit that shit out. I don't want to hear I don't want to hear that shit. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show yeah. my shins. So they can't tell you what to say. You got if you're righteously speaking, who's to tell you not to speak? Right. That's right. <laughs> Money. Big old told you. He told you to read. Eight out. Eight dollars and ninety-five cents. <laughs> Big old. If you, if you cash at me, eight dollars and ninety-five cents. I'll read it. Nah, I'm out. Shalom. Coming back for this. Y'all gonna get this work right here. This. This is it. This is what y'all love right here. This is what y'all think is fucking cute. This is the shit right here that y'all think is cute. And you say, oh, dresses aren't just for girls. Anybody can wear a dress. This is, this is the shit. This, this that book got kind of shit. Right that book got 700 pages. 715. 715. Wow. And you're going to get that wow. work. You're going to get that work. Oh man. <laughs> oh, so economic that's advantage. Funny. Advantage. They have an adoption advantage. 
in this capitalist society, economic security is the most important variable looked at when assessing who among those applying to adopt will qualify and be granted the privilege of raising an orphan child as their own. High incomes give homosexuals much easier access to orphan African children. So these faggots yep. mm -hmm. are adopting these children, sexually mm -hmm. abusing them, physically mm -hmm. abusing them, and psychologically abusing mm -hmm. them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you got these weird ass devils adopting these African children. Y'all see them and then they raising them like girls. Mm -hmm. Y'all see that yep. shit. The case where two European male homosexuals adopt a young African male is not to be ignored or in any way considered judicial impossibilities. It is real not possible for a heterosexual European family to adequately raise an African child into the true cultural being. How can a European homosexual couple possibly qualify? That's all I'm reading out of that book. Y'all ain't, y'all not, I ain't ready for that shit. They over there with their white friends and their mixies and their fags and shit, you know. <laughs> don't hear them in your mind, okay? Don't <sighs> Oh, oh my god. Way. I don't feel that way. This is how they was able to kill Dr. Bobby, right? I don't feel that way. I don't, I don't feel that way. I don't feel he, do you do you feel the same way he does? That guy on here? He's feeling that rhetoric and that hatred. I just told you that book is seven hundred and fifteen pages. It's not rhetoric. Yep, Dr. Bobby talked about research that. by an African Senate social scientist who created this book. This was the first of its kind from an African author. The first of its kind. 715 pages. Guess how much this book is? $30. Can't even get a damn video game for thirty dollars because y'all play fucking video games. But you won't spend thirty dollars on something that have you understand this targeted conditioning in this onslaught that's been happening for like the last fifty years or so. This subtle introduction, and then after the seventies, like this total onslaught, and how this plays a role in our liberation. Any man, woman, or child that tell you it does not matter what somebody does in the privacy of their own home and in no position to speak about the future of African people. Not this genocide, yeah. I'm gone. I'm out of here. So tell them one more time, tell them shalom. One more time. Shalom. <laughs>